Hello everyone and welcome to today's postgrad insights session in association with today's sponsors Henley Business School. Today we are going to discuss and everything and go through everything you need to know about developing and navigating your career in a post-pandemic world. What I'm about to go through is everything that postgrad.com has to offer in addition to the fantastic opportunities that we've got on scholarship opportunities um, on top of everything that Henley Business School have got to offer. Before I move forward, a few house rules. Please ensure that if you have any questions or if you have any issues throughout the next 45 minutes to one hour that you ask in the chat section or the Q&A section at the very bottom. In addition, if you have any concerns that aren't raised throughout the session, please email gareth at postgradsolutions.com. So what will Postgrad Insights offer? Why you should use postgrad.com to find a perfect postgraduate program, a chance to win £500 off your tuition costs, COVID safe study in the UK, the presentation and panel discussion from Henley Business School, and details of the upcoming Postgrad Insights. What does postgrad.com have to offer? So here at postgrad.com, we've helped over 10 million students find their perfect postgraduate program. We have over 200 countries for you to study at, partnerships with high caliber international scholarship providers, such as Achievening and Marshall Scholarships, best advice and accommodation, visas, careers, and English language support, funding subjects, and much more, making postgrad.com the one-stop shop for all things postgrad related. You will notice at the bottom here as well, there is eligibility on our 20 postgraduate solution bursaries worth £500 each. A little bit more information about that and what that entails. Anyone, and when I say anyone, anyone from any country studying uh, full-time, part-time, blended learning within campus, online only, is eligible to apply for this bursary with a deadline of September the 30th please ensure you apply for this. There is no um, crossover with any other funding opportunities that you might apply for or wish to apply for. So please get applying on postgrad. A little bit of information about COVID safe studying at the moment. Um, a lot of the UK has returned to half normal this week with um, campuses reopening. Um, so as long as campuses prepare to resume opening, a few things that the student yourselves can do. Please ensure you wear face coverings around the universities, great hand hygiene, ventilation where possible. And if you are required to, please self-isolate and get regular COVID tests. Now, I would like to hand you over to our sponsors today, who is Henley Business School. Um, George, who is an academic and a professor at Henley Business School, I'll hand you over to him now. There will be a panelist and a Q&A session throughout this um, presentation, and I will be back towards the end to conclude and to make you aware of the upcoming postgrad insights. George, over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm gonna try and um, share my screen now, see if that works. Does it work? Yeah, George, that's great. Um, so you can see the presentation, okay? Yes, absolutely fine, George. We can see everything. Excellent. We can see your face studying at Henley Business School. Excellent. All right. Well, uh, hello, everyone, and um, uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, wherever you, in the world you know you you're joining us from. Uh, it could actually be good evening. In fact, um, I hope. You are you're well, and thank you for joining this, this panel discussion uh, today, uh, which I look uh, forward to, uh, and I think should be very interesting. Uh, before this, I'm just going to kick this session off, spending no more, I would say, than 10 minutes introducing Henley Business School, and essentially what you guys can expect, uh, you know, if, if you're students, if you were to study at Henley. Uh, so first of all, um, I'm sure you might have done your research, but you know some of you may not know. Henley uh, is actually the first business school ever in the in the UK, and it was launched in 1945 after the the Second World War in the town of Henley, 
uh, and back in the day, it was actually called Henley Management College before it, it merges with, with the university, with the University of Reading in 2008, uh, when it actually became uh, Henley Business School. And being the first business school um, in the UK, Henley, of course, is also one of the leading business schools. Um, based on, on most rankings, we are, as you can see here, in the top five in the UK as a business school. So for executive education and you know, MBA programs, for instance, we are in fact in the top five in the UK, according to the rankings such as The Economist and, and Financial Times. Uh, for masters, which is probably more of interest to you guys, we are in the top uh, five, for instance, for masters in finance uh, and, and in the top four for um, careers progress. Um, so, uh, you know, a world top position, I would say, which I think provides a good, uh, you know, flavor of, of, the, of the quality of, of education you might expect joining us for a master's program. And Henley, of course, is one of the 90 business schools in the world that are triple accredited from uh, the three um, you know, major business school accrediting bodies that you can see here down at the, at the bottom of, of the slide, which are AA, CSB, Equis, and, and AMBA. Um, this is um, our full portfolio of master's programs. And as you can see, we have a very diverse portfolio of programs you can choose from. And, you know, in my role um, as, as head of programs, I'm responsible, if you like, for the strategic oversight of, of this portfolio. Um, my email address, in case you notice, was in the, in the first slide of this presentation. You can find presumably all panelists' contact details online, actually. Uh, and, and we would be very happy you know, to answer any questions you might have about a specific program uh, from all of these. So do feel free to, to contact me or any of us if you have a question about a particular program. But really what I wanted to do uh, as part of this introduction is I wanted to take a few minutes to explain our teaching and learning philosophy, if you like, and, and how uh, the student experience is different at Henley Business School. So we have developed this teaching and learning philosophy based on these uh, five simple uh, you know, building blocks. Um, the first one is that um, you know, survey research has shown that the, the first thing on, um, on, on, on your minds, on, on students' minds, is basically you know, your career after graduation. Um, and, and as part of, of, of their studies at Henley, our students uh, have access to a uh, transformative, if I might say, careers development program, which includes things like, you know, one-to-one -one careers coaching uh, with dedicated careers advisors and specializing in your program of interest. Uh, it includes, you know, weekly workshops, master classes or panel discussions delivered from uh, professionals, senior professionals from leading companies in, in London and, and elsewhere, uh, as well as, you know, our students, depending on the program of their choice, they, they tend to get access to things like placement opportunities, uh, interviews with employers, you know, company visits, careers fairs, and so on. So I would say there's a lot of employer-facing activity, uh, which our students find really, really useful. Um, and I think the fact that the majority of our students across different programs are in jobs after graduation uh, reflects well that we take careers, you know, seriously. Uh, and we have built a careers uh, program that really aims to support you uh, and support our students with, with your career aspirations. Uh, the second corner store is employability skills. And, uh, you know, we're currently actually in the process of redesigning our program portfolio to embed more of these employability skills in our program curriculum. Uh, and these employability skills are the, the, the type of, the, the, the sort of skills that are sought after by uh, employers. Uh, and, I, and I guess by undertaking a master's program, uh, other than learning, you know, more about the, the recent trends and, and developments, in, in your market of interest, you will also be looking to improve 
things like your self-awareness, your communication skills, your um, networking skills, to become more curious, to become more technology ready, if you like. Um, and, and all of these um, and many more uh, are important skills that employers are, are looking for increasingly when employing you know, master's graduates. And our programs, I would say, are designed with, with such skills in mind. Um, one of the most important um, things that Henley is famous uh, for is our practice-centered, um, experiential, if you like, teaching and learning approach. Now, we want our students to acquire you know, skills that they will be genuinely able to use when interviewing to secure for a job. Um, or indeed later, you know, when they, when they have secured a job and they're working on a desk, uh, be it a big bank or an investment fund or a real estate company or a consulting and accounting firm and so on. Um, so our courses, I would say, are designed with all these practical skills in mind. And this is our own motto as well. More practice in technology, less theory. Uh, and that's what you can expect uh, joining Henley Business School. Uh, engagement with the industry um, is, is also something we invest more and more in. Uh, you know, we always aim to, to, to engage with, if you like, the big players. And our academics uh, and, you know, people in the panel today as well uh, tend, to, tend to be leading, you know, authorities in their field, collaborating very closely with the industry. Um, so if we think um, Big employer like major banks, boutique banks, consulting firms, you know, accounting firms, and so on, uh, corporates, of course, IT companies, uh, they recruit directly from us. And you know, some of the senior practitioners visit Henley to deliver talks to our students. And the reason why we invest uh, time and resource in engaging with the industry uh, is, of course, to cement you know, our reputation in the market and therefore improve our students' chances of securing good roles uh, after graduation. Last but not least in this sort of philosophy um, is the student experience. So let me just say that our students' experience here is our ultimate um, priority, guys. And, you know, we, we very much see our students as our stakeholders. Um, we want our students, we want our alumni to remember the time in the UK uh, forever as one of the best periods in their life and, and to spread the word to others. Um, and the reason for this is we firmly believe that we can only succeed if our students truly enjoy their time here and, and you know, go on and do well in life and make a positive impact to the world. So your experience and listening to our students' needs is, I would say, at the center of, of what we do and at the center of this philosophy that we follow. Uh, and that defines our approach pretty much. And I, and I hope this summarizes this philosophy uh, well. Uh, finally, um, you know, some key points for, for next academic year that might be of interest to you when considering your choices. Um, and this year has, of course, been very different to any other year. And, you know, a lot of things have changed, uh, which will certainly have, uh, you know, uh, an impact. And we will have the chance to discuss later uh, as part of the panel. Um, but with, I would say, more than half of the UK population having received uh, a coronavirus vaccination uh, and our campus in Reading, by the way, being officially open now, uh, I think we're quite optimistic that there's much to look uh, forward to uh, this summer. Uh, and we're very much looking forward to welcoming our students for the start of the term uh, in September, um, but have also, of course, catered to provide uh, flexibility to our applicants and, and offer holders um, because we know this is a peculiar year and because we know this is necessary and will be appreciated. So, like most other UK universities, next academic year, we will be delivering our teaching based on a blended approach. Um, and this approach, you know, we will be able to talk more about it as part of, of the discussion later on, but let's say it would combine the best of both worlds 
face-to-face uh, -face delivery as well as online delivery in a way that I think for reasons that we can discuss later uh, about the future of higher education in general, I think can further enhance our students' experience. Um, we have also made our deposits refundable in case one is unable to travel to the UK due to, um, you know, due to the pandemic. So if you apply for a course and you pay your deposit, you will be able to, to claim it back under certain um, terms and conditions if you're unable to travel. Uh, we have increased our scholarship funding to around £750,000, um, offering scholarships you know, across the range of our postgraduate program. So if you were to apply now, you might also be eligible to apply for a scholarship. And we still have funding left at this point to give out. Um, and on top of this, we are now offering, that's something very recent, that's something that's been announced just today, a £1,000 bursary to all international candidates that apply before the 15th of June. Uh, and I appreciate that might be seen as a small discount, you might argue, but it, it really, I, I think that the point of this is that to be a token of, um, you know, appreciation and support, if you like, given the current uncertainty. Um, that's it for me. Um, thank you very much. Uh, and, and I would, of course, uh, you know, be very happy to respond to any questions you might have on, on any of these or indeed, um, you know, any of the points raised as part of the panel discussion. Uh, we can't hear you, Louise. Perhaps I'm not on mute. <laughs> Thank you, George, for that presentation and um, the introduction to Henley. Um, my name's Eloise. Um, I'm part of the postgraduate recruitment team um, at Henley Business School. Um, and today I'm going to be hosting a panel session um, with George um, and uh, uh, one of our academics and a member of our careers team um, covering COVID-19 in business and in master's study. So if you have any questions for um, us and the panel today, please put those into the Q&A box um, and we would love to discuss um, some of the questions or thoughts that you have around the topic. Um, so to introduce our panel to you, um, Professor George Alexandridis, um, who is Head of Pre-Experience Postgraduate Programmes at Henley Business School. Uh, Professor Cleo Akriviu, um, our Programme Director for uh, the Masters in Management, and Graham Philpot, who is our Careers Consultant for Master's Students at Henley Business School. Um, Cleo and uh, Graham, would you like to give um, just a short introduction to yourselves? Um, Cleo? Hi, Eloise. Hi, George. Hi, Graham. Hi, everyone who is attending today. Uh, very happy and pleased to be with you here today for our panel discussion. And I was also looking, uh, I was very excited with what uh, George was announcing because I have just heard it from the horse's mouth today. <laughs> so uh, I'm Professor Cleo Akrivu and I'm Professor of uh, Business Ethics and Moral Development. I'm teaching Corporate Social Responsibility Ethics uh, and other, other capstone uh, experiential modules in our master's degree um, in both the spring and the summer term. I'm Graham Philpott. I'm one of the Henley Careers team. Um, Henley Business School's um, very fortunate in that we have our own careers team, uh, as well as the access to the University of Reading careers team. So come and join uh, us and you'll be able to uh, access services from, uh, from two different careers teams, which means we have a, a really great um, breadth of offerings, as well as the depth that as a, as a business school team we're able to give. I specifically lead on the careers support for the um, uh, business, information management and accounting master's students. I've also worked very closely with the finance students for uh, quite a long time as well. Uh, so the only area I'm not particularly expert on are the real estate and planning, but if you have any questions from that, I'll give them my best shot uh, as we go through the uh, session. Of course, uh, just to add that I'm program director, as Eloise said, uh, which I did not repeat, but I'm just saying I'm program director of our master's in management, which is another of our flagship programs, ranked programs at Henley. So I would be very happy to answer any emails you have about the Masters in Management in particular. Eloise? 
Yeah, thank you. Um, so in the panel today, um, we're going to discuss um, the impact of the pandemic um, on business um, and organisations, but also on higher education and master's study, and how, potentially how that's impacted graduate careers. Um, so if you have any questions around those or um, about studying at Henley Business School or how Henley has adapted to the pandemic, um, then please pop those in the Q&A. Um, we're going to start off kind of... Um, during the pandemic pandemic so we've seen a range of responses to COVID-19 um, and the global environment has changed so quickly and has been um, really uncertain for so long and it's starting to feel a little bit more certain but there's still potential for things to change quite rapidly. Um, Cleo for the organisations who have succeeded in adapting um, what strategies or skills have leaders in these organizations used to adapt well to the challenges we faced thank you very much Eloise, for this very interesting um, very interesting question uh, first of all to start saying something that uh, you mentioned change and uh, i want to start by saying that uh, there is a profound change we are going through due to covid um, and also that uh, in many ways, these changes that are happening at the global and national uh, local levels have not yet, yet concluded, right? So they are still, we are still undergoing these change. Um, I also believe that uh, we will see in, in the future years that perhaps this period we are uh, living through is a period that uh, changes profoundly the world stage. Um, so from a postmodern and uh, let's say late 1980s, 1990s time when we, we were living under extreme in a way complexity and maybe fragmentation um, to some extent insustainability. Now we are suddenly uh, turning into, I believe, in more holistic uh, um, times where whatever we do as leaders, as organizations, and as individuals requires deeper and more holistic responses. My research, I researched for many years around that, ethics, moral development and leadership, and this is really what I'm seeing through my research. Uh, so change is profound um, and still ongoing. Um, I think this also, I don't know if you felt it for yourself, your families, yourself, your co-workers, your friends, but change uh, um, affecting also how people feel and think about each other, about uh, work, but also um, work is part of life, right? So about life as well. And when I say people, I mean employees, customers, I mean, I mean um, professionals in the very different professions and future professionals. So I was just reading yesterday, for example, in our news here that certain professions are managing are having very hard time recruiting new people in that profession because people are very uh, scared or we weary of what happens, how COVID will uh, affect future employability they have. So this is really uh, profoundly affecting the professions and how people are thinking about their future. I think also overall citizens have uh, a new voice or a new appreciation of both the good and the bad side of what their governments offered in terms of uh, keeping them safe in the pandemic. So uh, very profound changes. So uh, in terms of leaders, uh, to acknowledge, I think, these profound changes, we have to think at two levels. So, so far, in, in many years um, till to date, I think we were talking often at one level. And definitely, we would say, yes, at this one level, we still need profoundly effective adaptation skills, resilience uh, by leaders. Um, leaders have to uh, get used to making decisions under uncertainty and uh, also uh, think about maintaining resilience, but also helping others maintain resilience. People we work with, you know, people we work with and we lead can be in bad moods, can go through changes, can be overworked, can be uncertain. So how can you help them maintain their resilience? It's not enough for leaders themselves to be resilient. But there is another level, and this level I'm talking, uh, it is what I'm, I'm really researching through multi years research. It is a deeper level of leadership, I would call it capability level, a deeper level, which I believe involves 
the skills like, it's not skills really, capabilities that have to do with intellectual and moral characters. And these um, things, these uh, uh, features capture virtues, for example, such as our courage, our capacity for fairness, our capacity for uh, temperance, for benevolence. Um, and also the extent to which we can remain wise, so we can make continuously decision, but decisions, but we have to think what comes next before the next stage has really come. And this wisdom has to be practical. It has to, to really pertain to how we want to see people uh, leaving uh, their jobs, engaging with their employer, with their organizations, but also their lives. So wiser organizations, wiser le leadership that aspire to higher values, and they are inspired of higher values. Um, uh, now, another comment about this level is that I think the crisis did not just threaten our economic prosperity, because of course the economy went back globally, right? So economic prosperity, um, undeniably was th threatened and organizational success um, was threatened, but it is a chance as well because it is a chance for us to reflect that we need to change and we need to change for a wiser, a better future. Uh, and here I would say leaders have to get used to the word stop, think and act. Stop means that very often, I think especially before COVID, we have been seeing many leaders being on some sort of autopilot mode and many of us were on autopilot. And that is something we have to stop. So the second higher level of wise leadership I talked about, I think needs to reprioritize what really matters. For example, economic prosperity matters a lot, but equally, equally to it, if not more, uh, matter, people's well-being, flourishing, planetary, ecological, in a way, a mindfulness, so that we do not destroy uh, the resources, the planet we live in. And finally, uh, a reflection that uh, many things must change in how leadership um, goes on in the future. So to stop from this autopilot, and ask, learn to ask questions, questions such as reconnecting with purpose and values, why questions, what for questions, and being really the best they can be in their role of leadership. So these are some uh, starting thoughts, Eloise. Oh, fantastic. And um, you mentioned there um, about some industries can struggling to recruit um, still within the pandemic. And I, I saw a similar news um, uh, piece last night on the six o'clock news. Um, Graham, are, are you finding um, that reflective of a lot of industries that there's that uncertainty of, of wanting to take on certain roles because of the pandemic? I, I think it the a lot of people have been holding on to roles over the last period of time. If they've been lucky enough to be in work and they've been lucky enough to feel that it was going to be relatively stable, then um, people have tended to think, well, I'm going to stay where I am uh, until I see things are coming out the other end. But I think whilst they're doing that, they're also reassessing what they want to do in the future. And um, we're going to go into an, a period, I think, where there's going to be an awful lot of job movement where people have started to think, actually, what do I want to do with my life? Is uh, my current employment giving me those things? And uh, there's been, uh, as with everything else, I think uh, what, what the last period of time has given us is a mass um, acceleration in terms of what was already happening. And thoughts around purpose and how can employers ensure that um, employees have purpose at work was already um, a conversation before COVID. But I think it's going to be absolutely magnified now. Um, so it's it's not just a kind of a safety thing, but there are certain environments where people are thinking, well, you know, what would be my purpose if I go into industry X and industry Y? Maybe I should be going to somewhere else instead. So there are going to be certain industries that um, have, um, have been able to get away without having the purposeful link uh, in the past that might have to readdress that. I think how can we make it? feel more meaningful to come and work for us. So it's almost reflecting kind of people's career uh, thoughts and choices during this time, almost reflecting what Cleo said about the the um, the organisations and the leaders that kind of stop, think, 
um, ask those what why questions and, and looking for that value and that purpose in what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, fantastic. Um, George, um, I, just thinking on, on that, um, when it comes to universities, um, you know, how have they adapted well? Um, you know, we've kind of been thrown right into it with having to change things quite quickly. So maybe not having that opportunity to stop and, and think about what the next step is. Um, but how, how do you feel higher education in general has adapted to the pandemic? Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question, Eloise. Um, first of all, as I mentioned, I mean, last year uh, or so, more than a year now, uh, we have experienced probably the, you know, one of the one of the biggest changes in, in the history of, of business, like Clio uh, noted earlier, end of education, of course. Um, we're talking about tens of millions of, of school and university students, uh, you know, move their work and studies online. Um, education moved from, from campus to, to bedrooms, to living rooms, to kitchens, you know, you name it. Uh, and we might recognize that in the future, um, that this ultimately uh, was a historic moment, in fact. Um, so COVID-19, in my view, reshaped you know, how we work and, and study uh, uh, forever. Uh, and I think universities around the world, uh, come, coming to your question, um, actually responded in a resilient, I would say, way um, by doing what they had to do which essentially most part of the world uh, was to move delivery online. And of course, this wasn't without challenges uh, because no one was sort of, you know, prepared, if you like, exactly for this. And, and various uh, institutions responded in different ways. Uh, and, and there are, of course, big variations in, in the quality of delivery. Um, but overall, I would say that, um, you know, um, from the transition to online learning uh, was quite successful in, in, in most places. And I would be happy to, to talk more about what Henley did to respond to that, if you would like me to, Eloise. That was going to be my next question. So um, how has Henley specifically adapted um, okay. to, to online and blended learning? That's great. So, uh, I mean, he uh, at Henley, luckily, uh, we have a 50 year strong experience in, you know, delivering programs on a flexible basis. Um, you know, which, which these flexible programs essentially offer participants the opportunity to attend online and face to face. Uh, so it's a combo combination. And I think this experience actually paid off in this case. Um, so with respect to our delivery approach, um, <clears throat> we aim to adopt a blended learning model uh, whereby we opened our campus uh, for most part of the year. Uh, so most of our students were here, in fact. Um, and, and at least in the autumn term, our services like, you know, restaurants, the library and so on were actually open, uh, subject to social distancing rules. Um, we put a plan together to cater for the safety uh, of, of our students. And I have to say here, the safety of you know, our staff and our students in this plan was, was actually our top priority. Um, and, and as a result, in fact, we had a limited number of, of cases um, you know, on campus uh, and we had a good test and trace uh, system uh, in place to prevent you know, the virus from, from spreading. Uh, and we even have a testing facility on site where our students could get tested when they wanted. Uh, so in the end, we rolled out thousands of COVID tests. Um, in terms of our delivery, uh, we delivered our large classes online. Um, and the reason for this is it was practically impossible to cater for social distancing, you know, in these circumstances. Um, and for most courses, we also delivered workshops and seminars face to face subject to social distancing, masks, and so on and so forth. Um, we also did virtual drop-in sessions where students could drop in and ask questions and you know, networks among, among themselves and so on. Um, and many of us also did things like virtual group sessions where groups of students could work together on their projects. Um, we delivered our careers development program 
entirely online, uh, synchronously and asynchronously. Uh, we delivered our resources online, like you know, library, software, databases, uh, simulations, and so on. And I actually think we managed to pull this off quite successfully. In fact, I was quite surprised myself with the um, efficiency, if you like, of the operation. Um, and I think it, above everything, it, we, we managed to, to provide our students with all the necessary resources uh, you know, they would otherwise have available to them on campus. And of course, we also took exams online, which was a major operation, but one that was absolutely necessary and uh, I think was uh, largely successful. Um, and I think the most important thing to mention here perhaps is that surprisingly, uh, at least I was slightly uh, surprised, student satisfaction this year, as measured by the course evaluation questionnaires that students complete, were even higher than in a typical year. Um, and we got some excellent feedback early on. We responded to that feedback uh, as we normally do, um, you know, by adapting how we do and, and uh, you know, what we do and how we do it. And overall, most students I would say I, I spoke to were, were actually quite pleased with, you know, the quality of the end product we were able to deliver. Um, and of course, we have to be honest here. I mean, it's impossible to replicate 100% face-to-face education. Uh, we wouldn't want to do this, uh, and, and, and all of us, and I'm sure all of you in the audience today are, you know, looking forward for things to, to go back to normal, and, and next year uh, should be more normal than this one, at least, uh, or at least we pray it will be. Uh, but what I'm trying to say here is that one of the lessons we've learned from this experience is that absolutely the traditional pre-pandemic education model where one has classes to attend and shows up in a large lecture theater for all the classes, I think will evolve as a result of this experience. Um, and I think will evolve for the better. Uh, and I would like to think of Henley as a pioneer in terms of you know, uh, adopting and introducing education uh, innovations, if you like, that will be more widely adopted in the future, um, you know, that will make higher education more, more exciting and stimulating. Okay, fantastic. And I, I, Cleo and Graham, from, from your perspective, how have you found um, the response from your students? Um, I know we'd love to be back in lecture theatres and on campus, um, but, but how has the response been um, from your students you've been working with? Clear, should we get you first? Yeah, I think, of course, this year everybody has been affected in the same way, like you and me and everybody, meaning it's not our natural mode of, um, you know, of developing people in education uh, to do most of learning via, you know, uh, computer mediated learning. But uh, so that was, of course, there is always what we lost. But there is also, as George, I think, mentioned, what have we learned? What have we gained? I think every situation, and like I really hope everybody, you are probably quite young people, to think about it like that. Like it's full, life is full of these situations. Jobs, career is full of this situation. So it's about what has been lost, but also what has been learned and gained. And I believe that also students increasingly recognized because of course I say increasingly because in early days there has been an uncertainty from them as well, right? Questions like what happens with exams, th things like that. What happens if I'm away from for, uh, at home and I cannot travel? But I think I can see, uh, for example, in the module evaluations and what students talking about that what they received um, in most classes and modules and degrees, with very few exceptions that maybe there was a different method or um, something different, has been really overwhelmingly good. That means very interactive live sessions. So basically class, real class, that happens interactively with all of us being showing our faces and of course our offices and our desk and continuing to develop, you know, to, to analyze the cases and to uh, talk about theory, to have questions, to have reflections in the same mode we are doing today this webinar. 
Um, I have done many of them. I have done a lot of live interaction, interactive uh, classes with 60 students, let's say, present, or 20 students, or 30, depending if it was a full class or a seminar. And students were also very enthusiastically participating. And I must say, <laughs> really, like, very passionate from the beginning to the end. Of course, I think also many students said that the fact that we were also, in addition to teaching our lectures, we were recording our lectures. So a lecture is something, usually it's a two hour class where we have, of course, to teach theory because we are not a technical school, we are a university. So you need, in order to learn to apply something well, you need to be master first of really understanding what it is about. So some of these lectures, have been all recorded actually not some but all of these lectures were recorded and students were saying that sometimes now because they have the opportunity to study not just by going to the readings and the book uh, and their notes but they need they can go back to the lecture and play me again for example um giving this lecture they study more so they complain oh sometimes i feel very overworked but it is because they choose to go back to the material and study it. Study it for uh, their learning, for their revision, for their exams, but also to get the most out of it. I remember in my days, like which is very far away in time, when I was doing my master's degree, we were saying, my professors were saying, you know, master's is such a very intensive time of study, such an intensive, knowledge intensive degree that you have to be able to retain even 60% of what you will learn in terms of information theory is, is a success. And of course, 100% from the practical classes and skills, which we have a lot at Henley. So we are very kind of practice-based learning, experiential learning, etc. So students understand how to put it in practice. And I think they really, appreciated that. I will give you a final example, uh, which of course is not something I hope that will happen next year. On the contrary, I'm, uh, I'm planning for the opposite result next year. This year, as part of our Master's in Management program, we have a very intensive, rich, two weeks long study abroad in another European country. And it's one of the highlights of the program because we all go. I travel with my students and we stay in these two partner organizations and cities and we do a lot of a lot of learning but also a lot of community activities there uh, so this year we are doing the same but because we are not allowed to travel we are doing it online however we have a full online uh, international study visit um, taking place from may 31st to um, june 11 and it's full of activities um, from the other context the, the context we study which is a context this year in france uh, and uh, the, the activities are all live, interactive, and include virtual tours to the place, to the context, um, a lot of different uh, panel with panels with industry, interactive sessions and classes. And therefore, this is another form we have done for this uh, international study challenge. And still, this is uh, very, very rich in terms of what it gives students. Now, of course, as I said, when I started, we all think that next year we will be fully a campus-based university and many of these fantastic activities will take place um, not only in person virtuously, but also in person physically. So overall, I think has been exhausting a bit for all of us, but also a very rich and a good year. I think, I yeah, I think from a careers point of view, we, I think we're on track for a record number of careers appointments and careers event attendances this year, which has shown that people have been uh, really keen to engage with us um, online. And uh, I mean, part of that is that if you're sat at your desk anyway, it's quite easy. You don't need to go walk out to the lecture theatre or walk out to where the careers room is. So I think that's part of it. But I think also recruitment has moved online. So it's been very easy for students to be able to see how similar it is doing a practice interview with me on a one-to-one -one basis online to having a real interview at an assessment centre. They found it really easy to see how close it is to be um, sharing a group activity um, online as a careers event or as part of the course um, 
and being incredibly similar to doing a group activity as part of an assessment centre with um, fellow applicants for the job. So there's been something there in terms of a synchronicity between the kind of services that we're offering, the kind of things that they're doing on campus anyway, or at university anyway, and also the way that um, that recruitment has, has moved on to a you know a fully online process. So it, it's uh, it, it's been quite a virtuous circle, I think. Yeah, I wanted to ask you, uh, you know, with um, the recruitment cycle and recruitment processes, see a lot of it has gone digital, but has anything else changed in terms of the typical graduate cycles or um, with the job market for graduates? Um, I think the, the first thing to say is that the job market for graduates has stayed fairly strong throughout the process. So I think it drops by maybe 20%. So 80% is the same, um, which is, you know, I think is a really good um, headline number and it's often quite different from what people were hearing through general media when it's talking about all kinds of work uh, because of course the graduate recruitment market tends to focus on on the professions it tends to focus on training management it tends to focus on the kinds of parts of the sector uh, industrial sectors that were still doing relatively well um, during the pandemic because they were able to switch to to online working um, so that's that's um, uh, that stayed pretty strong. Um, not many employers have entirely moved out of graduate recruitment, even those that were struggling wanted to stay and still recruit a few, even if they didn't recruit as many. So that was one thing that stayed very similar. The cycle stayed very similar. So a lot of the bigger recruiters um, encourage application in the autumn term before you start the following autumn, and that has stayed the same. Um, those kinds of organisations tended to only visit a small number of universities because that's very resource expen uh, intensive and expensive. So that what they've tended to do is that they've broadened out their reach much more, um, which is uh, which is great because um, you know that's that's fitted in very well with their diversity and inclusion agenda, which has been just as live as dealing with the pandemic over this last year. So I think that was something that it's been easier to um, have a, a virtual connection with organisations that um, you might struggle to get to um, elsewhere. Um, and I think, you know, the final stages, as I've mentioned, is that it's the assessment centre part of the recruitment process that has really been affected um, because applications were online anyway, uh, interviews were online anyway, online testing was online anyway. So early stages of the recruitment process was already online. The big change that the recruiters had to make was how do we change an assessment centre into an online process? And you know, the thing that I've noticed is the, the, the positive impact that's had on the students. Because if you go into an assessment centre uh, in another town, then you've got to be able to pay for that travel to that other town. You've got to be able to, uh, if it's a long way away, maybe get a hotel. You've got to uh, take two days, three days out of your study, not just the assessment day. Whereas um, now people have been able to fit in, uh, go into a five hour assessment centre much easier uh, and be much less disruptive on a, on a wider range. So I know a lot of employers are, are, are thinking about um, you know, what is it going to mean when we can go back to um, in person? Do we really want to uh, as some of the benefits outweigh in some of the downsides um, and looking at some of the downsides? How can they do a bit more to be able to um, to deal with those? So some of the downsides with um, with on fully online recruitment is, uh, you know, how stable is your internet connection? That's obviously a big one. How good is your technology that you've got at home? Um, but, and then the other side of it is if you're going to an assessment centre in, in an office for an employer, you get to see the office that you might be working in. And that's that's been a little bit lost. So there's those kinds of things that employers are really wrestling with. Um, but I think they've quite enjoyed the um, the freedom that the online processes have given. And I think a lot of students have, have tended to enjoy that a bit more as well. And, and it's it's actually made them feel a little bit closer to some of these organisations than, the, than they were doing. Um, previously. So it's interesting to see how it changes over the next two years. I think a lot of the things that have, have happened in haste will continue because they've been very successful. I definitely think there's lots of um, positives to be taken out of the experiences that we've all been through. And George, how do you see um, university education and um, university life evolving post-pandemic? 
Yeah, thank you, thank you for the question, Louise. Um, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm one of those people that think uh, quite radical changes are, are ahead of us. Um, this turning point, if you like, this, this, this experience where um, virtually all universities around the world transition to, to online classes, um, among other things, as I mentioned earlier, I think highlighted some of the uh, important benefits, if you like, of some forms of, of virtual learning. Um, one example, for instance, is that recent research during this period has shown that participants tend to retain significantly more information when learning online. Uh, and even more are willing to participate and, and ask and have their questions answered on, for example, live discussion boards uh, than when they're part of a, of a classroom environment. Uh, or, an, or another example is the tremendous, I would say, value um, added from uh, great uh, technologies uh, that can be used to enhance the uh, learning experience of students, uh, both within the classroom and outside the classroom. So in my view, <clears throat> um, the need to adapt to, to the new environment um, highlighted, I think, the benefits of flexibility uh, in learning, uh, exactly as it highlighted that under certain circumstances, you know, working from home can come with significant benefits for, 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 from the point of view of both employees and, and businesses. Um, now, since obviously, you know, this, this question relates to technology, I think that as a result of all this trend, um, ed tech, education technology, as, as it's called in short, um, has become clearly the next big thing. Um, and, and there was $20 billion of investment already into ed tech in 2019, which is now expected to skyrocket going forward, of course. Um, and the overall online education market is predicted to reach more than something like 350 billion in five years from now. Um, and so at the same time, you have the increasing investment in you know, fast internet, 5G around the world. So in the future, I would say we can't really expect um, a, much, uh, diff a much transformed education market um, offering products that combine the benefits of both face-to-face -face and virtual learning. And Henley at the moment is focusing on, on, on uh, two main or three main directions, I would say. One is utilizing new technologies, such as things like lecture capture technologies or classroom interaction tools to enhance the student's experience in face-to-face -face learning uh, but also embed elements of, of, of blended learning that work well uh, generally, and we, we know now work well. Uh, and so embedding more of this into our teaching model um, that, that again can result in better educational experience. Um, and, you know, also recent experience, I think, has, has proved that, um, you know, things like that can help us deliver you know, more effectively elements of our offering, such as our careers development program that uh, Graham mentioned earlier. The second one, uh, the second pillar we've, we're focusing on is to invest in new technologies to deliver flexible and online programs, which will inevitably be more popular in the future. Um, because we're going to have a more globalized, if you like, education market where one doesn't necessarily have to travel uh, to gain access to great education. Um, so for all of this, um, new innovative technologies, and in particular things like conferencing software, uh, virtual uh, classroom software, uh, and you know, more advanced learning environments, lecture capture technologies that I mentioned earlier in particular, um, uh, and also software that cater for delivering teaching simultaneously face-to-face -to, -face to some participants and online to others joining from different parts of the world. 
I think will be a big part of the future um, of, of study, I think, Eloise. Uh, so definitely some interesting trends to watch there. And um, at, at Henley, we are following them and studying them very closely. I definitely think um, a, a more hybrid approach in everything is coming. Um, I think hybrid work is something that people are talking a lot about. Uh, you know, people like PwC, BDO, Facebook have already said post-pandemic that level of flexible working and, and working from home is going to be much more increased and encouraged. And um, Cleo, from a, a leadership point of view, when we're thinking about the future leaders that we've got watching the presentation today, um, what should they be prepared for? Are there mindsets, behaviours or strategies that they should be thinking about when going out into this post-pandemic career? Mm. Uh, thank you, Eloise. I, I think, first of all, uh, given that also I agree with George that technology and this uh, technological revolution is here to stay, at the same time coming from the point of view of uh, humanities, uh, business and humanities, moral development, I would say it's us, human beings, that uh, can make uh, more um, than the tools we use, right? We can use our tools uh, in a way which everybody does the same. Uh, and we can uh, move into a new phase of capitalism, which is the technological hypercapitalism, <laughs> where uh, our attention to technological excellence becomes uh, in a way the key thing, but we, it shouldn't be the key thing. So what I'm saying, I agree with George that we all adapted we all adapted very well. Uh, and so we learned and we gained a lot out of this crisis. For example, the UK, Europe, they are going through a fast adaptation to this technologically mediated work environment, which is great, I think. Um, even people who are not have not grown up as kids with technology have really adapted to doing um, things uh, really proficiently with technology. Um, but when it comes to leadership, I think the future and this crisis and this profound change, which by the way, I believe it's not only what we perceive, is also change we don't perceive. Others may perceive it, we not, may not perceive. So we, we don't all have the same perception of this change. So I think that is going to change profoundly in a way values towards values driven le leadership. So what matters, I think a lot is leadership with a heart and a mind, leadership that has in mind to work together uh, ethically. So ethic ethics is very much about sitting without people and doing something together about things that really matter to make the world a better place. So that's ethics is not something like a philosophy written by Aristotle, you know, in a in a philosophical book is about how do knowing that take, how do I take this wisdom and, and I apply it in life in a way that every century can be better than the previous century. So I think the future involves different kinds of challenges for leaders. The first challenge I think is a challenge of trust, uh, which means um, even when we think about us as educators, as a program director, as a module convener, as a professor, can my students, can they really say at the end of the term, at the end of the year, that as, I, as a leader in education, I'm somebody who they can trust? I think they do regarding me, but I think everyone as a leader has to really have this question at the bottom of their heart. Can I be trusted? Can my coworkers, my, uh, you know, uh, students, can they uh, trust me? Uh, universities, now that's another level because we are not only individuals, right? We have to work within institutions like our university, our business school that also have to be trustworthy, which means students have to trust the university, the business school, that they will, uh, I mean, do the very, very, very good strategy for them to get um, full value of their money, right, of their learning. That, uh, but also employees, we have to trust our employers that they will keep us, uh, make the best th things they can, that we can keep our jobs, that we can also grow and flourish and prosper. Another level is the, the level of well-being and flourishing. And I think their leaders have to maintain two different challenges. One challenge is to not 
forget that the well-being and flourishing of today, people who participate in life today matters. And second, or the second thing is tomorrow, like that we don't only act for today, because very often when we only act um, for today, future, um, you know, not only future generations, but people who come a few years later to do what we are doing may inherit problems, which I believe we all agree in my field in scholarship that the 80s, um, the 90s have really given to leaders today a lot of problems to solve rather than really opportunities and uh, sunshine, day, days full of sunshine. So I think we have to be careful when we act to make wise decisions in a way that both present and future um, is affected positively. Um, uh, future generations are very important because it's about my children, your children, my grandchildren, you know, people who are going to be in the same place I'm today and you are today. And I think it's very important to think about them having a good life. Um, and that means also ecology. So I think leadership also has to think seriously about not only humanistic issues and social justice, social cohesion, and, and other humanistic and social issues, but also ecology. So we live in a suffering planet, and I believe we have to learn in some way, however we act in whatever we do, to do things that can um, create reverse climate change, create an ecological conscience, and I would say ecological uh, solidarity across younger and less young people, uh, across people who come from different countries, developed, and um, less developed or developed and developing countries. There has to be something like an inspiration for everybody to work together um, to reverse these negative effects that we have uh, um, witnessed in the past decades regarding climate and regarding um, social um, and societal and humanistic crisis as well. We have a lot of wars, refugees, unemployment, and things like that. So we have a lot of challenges still ahead, but hopefully I think uh, going through COVID gives new inspiration and new space for reflection to leaders. Fantastic. And then we're, we're running um over time a little bit it's been some great discussion today so Graham maybe you could wrap us up in 30 seconds um how can students get ahead in this new normal um working world oh you're on mute I knew I'd do that <laughs> it's thought that people who are at the beginning of their careers now will have four or five career changes during their working life what we've seen over this last year is that things can change like that. So the most important thing that we can all do and get in the uh, get used to is the um, the idea of the growth mindset, the learning mindset that says, you know, what is there out there that I can learn? What can I um, practice and get involved in and be curious about and get good at? knowing that there's going to be another thing to get good at in the future. And whenever we go through that process, we're not going to be perfect. We're going to make mistakes and we're going to fail. So having the resilience to put yourself out there, to um, try things out, to learn from your mistakes and to keep going, that's the most important thing that uh, people can do. And a, pros a postgraduate degree is brilliant for that because you've got this massively condensed period of time, all these new people, all these new subjects to learn. There's so much you can push yourself and develop yourself and try things out that you haven't tried in the past. So perfect opportunity. Fantastic, thank you. And thank you so much to George and Cleo and Graham for um, being on our panel today um, and uh, some fantastic discussion and definitely some food for thought um, about the, the future um, and what things look like post COVID. Um, if you um, would like to learn more about Henley um, and um, experience um, the way that we do things at Henley and your master's study, um, you can join us every Thursday throughout the summer um, for the Henley master's experience if you scan the QR code that will take you to the page. Um, this Thursday we've got a second of our student perspective alumni and student panels 
Um, following Thursday, um, Graham's colleague Lisa will be talking about mindset and resilience to succeed. So following on quite nicely from Graham's last point. And then on Thursday, the 3rd of June, um, Gret George will be um, hosting a special information session to tell you a little bit more about what to expect from study at Henley um, in 2021, 2022 academic year. And you can also go back and watch Graham and Cleo's previous sessions um, on answering difficult interview questions and leading strategic change. And um, so some really fantastic sessions um, for you to get your teeth into. And I've put a link in the chat box. Join us on Friday for our Masters virtual open day and where you can find out more about our individual programmes at Henley and ask the questions that you have um, about study at Henley to our programme directors. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and I'm going to pass back to Gareth. Thank you, Eloise. Very insightful. And a huge thank you to George, Eloise, uh, Cleo and Philip as well. Um, thank you very much. Um, if, if there's anything else that anyone else has got in terms of questions, concerns, please forward them over to ourselves on postgrad.com, gareth at postgradsolutions.com, or reach out to Eloise. Um, I believe they've put their contact details in the chat. Um, just a reminder of the Postgrad Insight sessions that we have got coming up. Um, the next one will be a study in Southwest issue, which will be our sponsors, Plymouth University, Plymouth Marjoram University, um, followed by um, Urban Est, study in London, study in Scotland with University of Glasgow, study in London with Kingston University and study in France in November. Um, keep an eye out for all the different insights that we've got coming up. But for the time being, a huge thank you again to our sponsors today, Henley Business School. If you want to watch this on demand, it will be on postgrad.com. We will be sending everyone that has um, viewed this the, the link to watch this in full again. And for those of you watching on social media, on both our Facebook Live and our YouTube Live platforms as well, thank you very much for joining. We will see you soon. And thank you very much. Take care. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.